Hey guys, welcome back. This is part two of the Prosperity Report Life Edition, where we talk about Red Table Talks and Will and Jada's relationship and how that conversation impacted Leia and I. Hey, Leia. Hello there. So good to see you. I love that we're recording on a Saturday. It has a relaxed feel and I'm in the moment and I'm excited to dive in with you. I think we should maybe record on Saturday some more. I know. I, I feel it. I totally feel it. I just finished an awesome yoga sculpt class. Oh. Uh, the play the playlist was like old school, like the type of music my parents would listen to, Motown, a little oh. Jackie Wilson, a little um, Bee Gees, and it just put me in such a good mood. Cool. Music can do that. I love that about music. It can really change your, you know, state is what we call it. In 100%. Yeah. Yeah. And I've actually been changing my whole mind frame from this like worker B work, work, work to the CEO of the company. So I don't really do much work on Saturday. I used to like pound it out on a Saturday, like, woo, nobody will bother me. I can get so much done. Mm -hmm. and now I'm like, mm, no ma'am. Like, we're just gonna go with maybe two, three hours tops and then chill. Yeah, I think that there's a relaxed feeling to being able to like luxuriously spread out your work versus kind of this sharp line between working and playtime. And I know with this type of topic, like you and I would talk about this anyway. So it's not the type of work that might have elements of, um, you know, being outside of what your interests are or like that have to versus get to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, and that's part of my life too, because I get to do this work. Like I love this work. I love podcasting. I I love meditation, uh, everything that I do, even therapy, I love it. So it, re it becomes very difficult to stop when you love what you do. Yeah. yeah. It's funny that you mentioned meditation. I've had so much resistance to it um, over the course of my life. You and I have talked about this, like you're always sending me, oh my gosh, I just listened to this amazing meditation. And I'm like, thanks. <laughs> And then we don't talk about it because I probably <laughs> haven't listened, but I had the most amazing experience this past weekend. We'll talk about it more in an upcoming episode, but it was with a woman who she's known as being a therapist and a parenting expert, but her foundation is rooted in uh, Eastern philosophy and meditation. Yeah. And at the end of this four day experience that she had this live experience, she did a five hour silent meditation. Hmm. Um, that was wow. transformational. And at the end, you know, we had, we had been learning and growing and kind of breaking ourselves open with this group of people, about 350 people. And at the end, instead of having us say goodbye to each other with words, she had us go around for about 10 or 15 minutes. And we just made eye contact with someone. Maybe we had an experience with them throughout the, the weekend. And we just embraced and she really encouraged us to use um, like physical touch and energetic connection over words because it gets you in a very different place. And I am not someone who normally um, breaks down, opens up emotionally, cries. I Tears were like streaming down my face by the end because with meditation, you get so in touch with your essence. And then all of these other people had been getting in touch with their essence over the course of five hours. And we were just connecting like soul to soul. And it was such an intimate experience. Mm -hmm. um, and I absolutely loved it. And after that, I was like, I get it. I get that it's really hard for me because I'm very productivity oriented. But sometimes the hardest things are like where the growth is. Mm -hmm. And I ended up getting um, a couple online courses she has. And I've been um, so enjoying and appreciating them. Uh -huh. So, uh, so kudos to the journey to get to a place of embracing meditation. Yay. Yes. <laughs> I, I'm often, um, pouring meditation on people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they don't, it, yeah, it's, it's not the thing that's easy to understand, but I mean, neither is electricity and we still use it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> I have really no idea what happens 
when I turn the light switch on. Right. But I don't let that stop me from Same. using. Yeah. Same thing with love. Like everyone has experienced it. Everyone can describe it, but it's not tangible. Right. So, like it, yeah, a- absolutely. So speaking of love. Yes, girl. <laughs> this part two episode though. I mean, well, can I get a fitness? <laughs> oh, I wish this was, it was magical. And I wish uh, more conversations like this existed in the world. Yeah. I was laughing because um, in preparing for our conversation, I was looking at some other interviews that the two of them had done. And there was one that they did with Oprah and the entire family maybe two years ago. Hmm. And you think Oprah, like Oprah will get to the heart of it. Like Oprah is going to dig deep and she's going to get the jewels and the nuggets. And I say this without judgment. It was such a superficial conversation. And I'm wondering if it was maybe just because Will and Jada hadn't been cracked open. I think that was right on the precipice of of Jada's evolution, which then sparked Will's evolution. Um, And I was so grateful for the work that they've done and then this platform that they're using to share it um, because, Mm -hmm. like you said, it was such a powerful conversation. Um, And I've seen the chatter on social media and there are so many other people who feel that way. So Um, You and I have discussed kind of some of the themes and the aha moments that really stood out for us. And uh, let's dive in. Yeah. So the theme of today's show, because we're using this Red Table Talk episode, is about blocks. Because we felt like, and you add to this, Leah, but we felt like um, what kept them from happiness was their blocks. And that's something that I work on on a daily basis is helping people clear their blocks. So I love this conversation. And the three things that we noticed, and maybe even a fourth, but the ego, the inauthenticity, and the fear. So let's kind of break that down from a, how are you blocking yourself from your happiness just because you don't want to grow? Hmm. And I almost wonder... If it's, if it's more subconscious than that, oh yeah, I think that there are a lot of people, if you ask well, them, it's all subconscious. <laughs> it's all subconscious. <laughs> um, I, it's funny. Authenticity is something of, of all of those different themes. Authenticity is something that I think I am very committed to. And what I realized in this conversation, you know, when, when Will and Jada talked about, um, Jada's 40th birthday, which was the turning point in their marriage. Mm -hmm. When Jada turned 37, Will had already started planning this insane bash for her. And it was going to be Mary J. Blige. And he found these um, previously unreleased voice recordings that Jada's grandmother had made. And he was going to like produce them and share them with her and the world. And it was going to be this incredible celebration. And what Jada... Uh, illuminated for Will is actually, that wasn't Jada. Like all of the things he did, that is not Jada's essence. Jada is very inward. You know, she talked about Will loves to travel the world and be very outward, and she loves the journeys to be within herself. Mm. And so what she shared was like, Will, that was about you and your ego and presenting this image of our relationship to the world. Uh, Willow had even alluded to that in the last episode where she said, isn't it cute how daddy has this image of his family and it's really not us. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, uh, so I totally lost my train of thought. But what I meant to say was this idea of authenticity. Um, and I think that um, because of the, the wounds that I had in childhood, which I think were mainly around like being chosen, being part of the group, um, being like picked, being special, um, like a pretty common core wound. Um, I think that I have embraced a life intentionally or unintentionally where I'm really working to heal that. And ironically, I haven't had a lot of relationships because 
I think I keep going back to this idea that like I need to keep choosing myself and I can't turn externally to get that validation from someone else. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to compromise and I'm not going to be in a relationship just to get picked. Like I'm going to do the work till I get to a point and I feel like I'm super close where I am consistently picking myself. And so I feel like I almost have the opposite dynamic than what they described. I think a lot of people settle for relationships where they can't be authentic and they're living in fear and they're putting on this show and they're wearing masks because of the fear. And I think I might have almost gone in the opposite direction where I put up obstacle courses and walls so that I can really make sure that I'm entering into an authentic partnership. Mm, yeah, but you can't. It's like, that's rehearsal. What you're doing right now is rehearsal. Mm -hmm. And you won't know until you get into a partnership. Because if you think about it, without each other, Will and Jada wouldn't have discovered what they discovered. Mm -hmm. even, with, even in our relationship, you and I, without you, I, there are things about myself that I don't discover. I can think inside my head, this sounds perfect. Mm -hmm. When I have a friend, I'm going to say this to her, right? But until I have a friend and I say it to her and she goes, wow, you need to set some boundaries. You all mm -hmm. over my stuff. Make decisions about your life. I make decisions about my life. Whatever the thing is, right? Right. So you don't know until you get in a relationship. So really, we rehearse. Meanwhile, and I think we should do that. We should rehearse and do our work and go to self-development because without those self-development classes those relationships end fast yeah <laughs> we don't even get a chance to we don't even get a chance to be authentic and have the whole like opening night <laughs> yep <laughs> there's this quote i love by esther perel where she says in every relationship there's one person who's afraid of losing the other person and there's one person who's afraid to lose themselves and i think that i am petrified of losing myself. Um, and that's something that I definitely bring when I'm considering a relationship, you know, when I'm dating, when I'm entering into a, a new relationship, which one of those do you think is you? Um, that's a good question. I don't know that. Oh, wow. That's a tough one because I have been like easy to go like, okay, see ya. Oh, yeah. but why? Like I'm not, so maybe then that means that I'm, I'm not going to lose myself. Like I'm not in fear of losing myself at all. Mm -hmm. So, so much that I will let you go, but I'm also not in fear of you leaving because I know it's billions of people in the world, billions. So mm -hmm. I'm bound to meet another one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I guess it would have to be afraid of losing myself, which is why I'm so easy to let go. Yeah. Because I'm a particular kind of person, but I am like, in love with the person that I have become. Not so much that I'm not growing ready right. to move to that next person because I'm also in love with the person that I'm becoming. Right. So if they can show me that, but my fear would probably be that they couldn't show me that. That's my biggest fear. Like, oh darn, like you haven't involved enough to help me. Like, come on, I need you. Yeah. <laughs> but, they yeah. talked about that a little bit in the episode that we really need to pull away from each other in order to find ourselves, especially if we get into a relationship early on at a young age. When we're in union, it's so easy and automatic and natural to just turn to the other person and blame them and project your stuff onto them. It's only when you're separate that you can, like Will talked about, uh, reading 50 books in order to better understand himself and his relationship. And Jada talked about really coming to terms with a lot of the fears and, and baggage that she had from childhood around men in relationships. And it's really hard to do that when you're in a close union and partnership with someone. Did you, did you agree with what they said they are? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, I, however, I think that that's the best place to do it. However, that's not how I've done it. Uh -huh. uh, more so the way you have. But yeah. I do think that in a relationship is the best place to do it because you can do it faster. The way you and I have done it, it's a really long road yeah. to like pour all of this stuff into yourself and wonder without doing a taste test, 
if the recipe is right. Yeah. So, and so they are in it and because they're in it, they can see really quickly if the stuff is working. Oh, did I execute on that, you know, thing that Dr. Um, Shivali suggested? Mm-hmm. Oh, no, I didn't execute on it very well. Oh, did I execute on, you know, what Esther Farrell says? No, nah, not really because my my spouse or my partner didn't respond in a loving way. So I probably projected more fear onto them. So how can I shift? Yeah. That's what you learn pretty quickly if you're in a relationship, outside yeah. of a relationship. You'll you'll know that you're still triggered or whatever, but you won't really have a platform to practice. Yeah. Yeah. I feel though. Uh, There are two ways in which I do that outside of a relationship. I think that reflecting on what happened and how I responded in the past has been useful for me. And I also find that there's so much that just happens in the course of life. Like everything can be a teacher. Mm -hmm. Case in point, I got back from being away for a couple weeks and there were two packages that I was really looking forward to. One was from a friend of mine. We had just done a course together and I had like surprised him with some coasters with quotes from the course leader on them of which uh, he's a big fan of. And then he said like, I got something coming your way, Uh, keep an eye out for it. And so I was curious what he had sent me. And then um, additionally, there were some um, like uh, health and wellness supplies that I'd ordered that I really need. I needed, I was all out. And I get home and I had gotten like the tracking, you know, notices from both of these packages. They had been delivered. I was good to go. Packages are nowhere in sight. You know, clearly someone from my apartment building, because we don't have security. It's just the packages are in a corner and you grab yours. Someone Uh had taken them. And it was really hard for me to, to like embrace what had happened and be just as okay with it happening as I would have with it not. And that's exactly... This it's exactly like Dr. Shafali's teachings. Like there is no good or bad. There's just the judgment that we put on a situation. Just like when it rains, the bride on her wedding day, you know, would be devastated. The farmer would be elated. It's mm-hmm. a neutral event, and it's the way in which we pass our own judgment and conditioning on it that makes it good or bad. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, so to kind of come full circle, like. To me, there's so much that happens in life that can be a teacher, whether you're in a romantic relationship or not. I feel like I can do the work and, and you know, use life experiences as teachers, and I can use the work to help me better understand how I operated within past relationships as well. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Definitely using past relationships as sort of like a um, barometer, I guess. Yeah. The, yeah, thermostat. Um, and you talked about um, something you said, oh, the story, the story. And really, that's the fourth block because I was like ego and authenticity and um, fear. And then that story, that's the really in the biggest block because mm-hmm. the, the, the story you tell yourself is going to create the fear or protect the ego so that he or she, I, I usually say ego is male, <laughs> but, okay. um, but it, it, it keeps the ego in place. And the story makes you feel like you are being often mm-hmm. when mm-hmm. really you're not. So many of my patients, we sit together and then, you know, and say, well, what about the authentic you? Like, don't you want to be the authentic you? And they're like, oh, do you want to be the authentic Yeah. That's a question. And they're like, oh, I am being authentic. And I'm like, oh. Okay, of course I got to meet them where they are, um, but later they'll see like I wasn't I wasn't being authentic. I'm like, yeah, yeah. And they're like, you knew that already. I'm like, mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> there was a really cool exercise we did, and it was perfect because it was around the time of Halloween where we each were given a mask like this, mm-hmm. and on the inside we wrote down. Um, Dr. Shafali calls them holes, um, but you know, core wounds would be another term for them. Mm -hmm. So um, the core wounds are our holes from childhood. And I shared some of mine. It's this idea of like being picked, you know, being chosen. Um, And I can go back to like specific points in my childhood. One was summer camp. I went to like the most snobby summer camp (laughs) 
in the world. Oh, really? It was, and, and I loved the activities and I loved everything we did. Um, and the people were like, really not my tribe. Um, and so it, it was extremely like materialistic, superficial. It was like who had the latest, like cell phones weren't even invented then, but like, you know, who had the fashion, who had the, the cool boom box, stuff like that. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, like going back to the, um, to the recess or, or I guess uh, phys, phys ed um, classroom and like the, the kickball game and like, you know, being packed pick last for kickball. It's all of these seemingly inconsequential experiences that I think can, can really just stick with us. Mm -hmm. um, and so those were the ones that I wrote on the inside, you know, being picked, being chosen, feeling special. And then on the outside, what we wrote were all of the masks that we wore and the ways that we try to compensate for those holes. Because when we're little, our parents give us validation for being the type of kid they want us to be. For a lot of kids, that's achieving in school, being great at sports, you know, not ruffling feathers, being a you know, good girl, et cetera. And so we learn that we get love when we put on that mask, the mask that our parents want us to wear and the mask that society um, you know, wants us to wear in order to conform. And so we end up at adulthood as this version of ourself that's really not true to our essence. It's just the person that we've been molded to become. And so on the outside, it was like, you know, overachieving, um, you know, performing, kind of putting on a show, mm -hmm. being a good girl, stuff like that. And it was a really powerful exercise. Um, and I thought it was, you know, for therapists out there, it could be a cool way to help yeah. patients uh, reconnect with their essence and, and understand kind of the, the places that they may be operating from in order to get love. Yeah, I could so see that. And the, the, cause the story that we are telling ourselves is that you know, we're, well, there are two stories. There's the one, the negative stories. We're not lovable. We're not good enough. We're too skinny. We're too short. We're yeah. too fat. We're too, too much. Cause sometimes, you know, a lot of people are talking about not being enough and, but a lot of, a lot of, well, I won't say a lot, but some people are going through life thinking that they're too much. I need yeah. to lay down so that I don't disturb the room or everybody is, not nobody is uncomfortable based on my yeah you know and I feel like Will can be that too much but he doesn't let that get in his ego was big enough to keep him from letting too much get in his way which is why he he felt like I'm thinking he felt like he loved Jada enough for both of them like for this marriage to work I love Jada enough for this marriage to work I'm pouring out all my love in this ego, you know, egocentric way, but he was pouring out all his love to keep this relationship together mm -hmm. while, because he was pouring out all that love in what he thought was an authentic way. He was basically blocking Jada from being able to be authentic. And she was so afraid of upsetting him, sh shattering his dream, that she just took on that whatever mask, <laughs> you know, whatever he was giving her, she just took it on because she's like, well, I guess I have to accept this because this is my husband. This yeah. is who he is. And I'm accepting him for who he is. Yeah. On the other hand, I don't get to be me. So who is he in love with? <laughs> yeah. I love what you just shared because I, feel like it got to the essence of pain, which was one of the, the themes that we shared at the beginning of the show. And so Will mentioned this, that he was often operating from this place of being the little boy that just wanted his mom to say, you did a good job. And so that's what he associated with love. And so fast forward to his relationship with Jada, he's building her this insane like estate and he's creating this incredible party for her because he's operating from this place of a little boy who just wants the person that he loves to say, you did a good job. Mm -hmm. And then rewind to the show where Jada talked about being on the island. And she said, like, forget the huge house, forget everything. Who are we if we're just on an island? She didn't want him to do she needed him to be, B-E, 
Mm-hmm. And I think that that was such like a pivotal moment in, in the show and in their relationship where Will got to a place where realizing, you know, he, he didn't need to perform. Like he didn't need to, he had mentioned, like, I felt that making money and winning in life equaled a great relationship. Um, and he was able to get to such a point of pain that he was able to destroy that belief and get to, you know, that next level in his relationship. Mm-hmm. And listening, I don't know if either of them have gotten the B part. I think you got that from what they said, but I don't think that either of them is, is at the point where they can just be. Mm. It felt like to me as, you know, in the work that I do in metaphysics, it felt like still a lot of doing in their yeah. relationship because they described as these life partners that were going to um, ride with each other and no matter what kind mm-hmm. of thing. And that's still a doing. Yeah. Thing. Um, I could see that. I, yeah, I feel like the being will come definitely now that they're on this side of their relationship, but it feels like they're still doing. And yeah. I, and I mean, that's not a, a, a judgment, just an yeah. observation, because you, you probably need to do some yeah. to find the B. Like, oh, here it is, where you just like sink into the being. But it, it takes pushing against the universe and, you know, and the universe pushing back before you find that groove and like, oh, here, you, here it is. Yeah. I, I like that Will was vulnerable and he said, I took two years off mm-hmm. and studied, like you said, the 50 books. Yeah. I studied what relation, you know, like what good relationships were supposed to be like healthy yeah. relationships, whatever his words were. Right. But he took time off. That was give, getting to the being. I mean, yeah. that was really getting in there, right? Where he took time off. But of course, he was still doing because we have to still do in, at the beginning. And um, he got to a point where he felt like he read enough that he could execute on mm-hmm. being a loving husband without there being Oh, what am I, an amateur? Like, was that my phone? <laughs> <laughs> it felt like he could be a husband without having his idea be, like, um, projected onto his wife in order for her. And it yeah. goes back, like, even to the parenting. You know, I deal with this a lot in parenting, and, you know, what Dr. Shivali talks about. But um, when, par- when parents want their children to be a certain way, it's like, do this, be this, go there have this, now you're a great child. And that's what Will seemed like he was living in his child because he was, and he said, I was looking for mommy to say, hey, you did a good job. And Tony Robbins talks about this all the time. If you watch any Tony Robbins videos, he's going to ask, whose love did you crave growing up? Clearly, you probably can see that Will probably craved his mother's love, even though based on the way he talks, it might seem like he probably uh, craved his father's love because he talks about his father being so harsh and, and yeah. abusive. but based on the way that he's playing this out, it seems like he maybe wanted his mother's love more. And so he was trying to get that from Jada. And the way that he was getting that is to say, let's have this beautiful, romantic, everybody envies us kind of marriage and then you'll be happy and I'll be happy and you'll see that I'm the one that gave it to you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Yeah. mm -hmm. Yeah. He never was able to give it to her because of those blocks. The ego was in the way because the ego was like, I know what a happy marriage looks like. Don't worry, babe. Don't worry about those things that you want. Right. (laughs) Right. And they even talked about like this, we have this idea that in order to be valuable, we need to be needed. And they said that the evolution of their marriage happened when they realized that they can be kind of self-sufficient, self-sustaining individual people that actually don't need each other. And that was a more elevated point in their relationship. Yeah. And um, that's rare. So <laughs> super rare. <laughs> but what I wanted to share is I actually feel like Like, if you look at the Red Table Talk series, to me, that's Jada being. And even though it's, it's, you know, it's a production and they're creating and they're creating something tangible, 
to me, this show is Jada's essence. Oh, and yeah. it's the way that she's sharing it and being of service to the world. And um, yeah, and so even though it is like a, it's a, it's a physical action that's creating the videos, to me, that's like a being, it's coming from a being place. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I can totally see that. It's, and that's why at the end, he was like, this is good for you. Like, he is enjoying watching her do it because yeah. finally he does get to see her. Yeah. He gets to see her. And last show, we talked a lot about the masculine and the feminine. And this is her and her feminine energy connecting and sharing and having girlfriend time. Because um, that's a lot of times what it, what it is. It's just her having her girlfriend time and being able to pour out what she's been through and, and receive which was as feminine, that's what we do. We receive. Yeah. And men, not necessarily, they don't necessarily receive. Um, but women, that's, that's our essence. That's how we were created. And so she does a lot of receiving. She sits and she listens. But you know, I have to give it up for my girl. Willow does the <laughs> most receiving ever. She is so good at listening, so good at receiving, being a part of the conversation. And even though this wasn't her conversation, she played her part so well in this episode. She didn't have much to say, but when she did say something, it was powerful mm. every time, but you know, never fails. Willow. Never fails. Willow doesn't fail me. <laughs> and even Will said like Willow has been his greatest teacher. Mm -hmm. I think in some ways Willow might have been, uh, or might've had the audacity to call him out, uh, like the whip your hair example is, is perfect. Mm -hmm. um, you know, she, she <laughs> I love that they refer to him as Mr. Jay-Z, but Will had obviously created this partnership with Willow and Jay-Z and Willow was like done. She'd done it. She'd gotten the experience and she was ready for, for the next moment. Um, and she helped Will see that what he was creating through her was him. And it wasn't her. And Willow in that moment, I think, had the audacity to very gently and loving him call, lovingly call out her dad. Um, and maybe that even gave Jada, you know, the strength to do it then years later at her 40th birthday. Mm -hmm. And to me, now that you bring that up, Willow is being. She has been being all through her mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. Wow. Now that we've said, and you know, I always give her her props, but this, always. yeah, <laughs> but this is a, a great example of being, because yeah. she, she was being herself, being her authentic self in, either, in every sense, mm -hmm. but because we are a moment to moment beings, she got to the moment where she was like, all right, that's enough. No more singing. I'm done with that. Yep. And, and because I am such a committed person, I can push myself through the I'm done to yeah. say no you gave your word this is what you said you're gonna do yeah do this like I can talk myself into doing it because because I what I like I said earlier what I said about them that was not a judgment that was an observation and the reason why I'm able right. to observe that behavior is because I possess that behavior because I tend to think if I keep doing, 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 yeah. I can control the situation. It will come out the way I planned and I'll have it. But so many times I've gotten confirmation that when I'm just being, when I'm just in it, and I yeah. talked about this early with the CEO life, as I shift to being the CEO rather than this worker be, I have seen the CEO delegate and sit down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I also think doing is a mask that we wear. Mm -hmm. I notice in yeah. moments where I'm not feeling great about myself or insecurity or whatever it might be, I'm, I'm feeling, uh, you know, ashamed of something. My subconscious default reaction is to do work because yes. <laughs> it's this, it's the, again, it's the ego. Okay. I'm going to perform. I'm going to get accolades and I'm going to feel better. Um, and I've noticed that about myself only recently, you know, in the past few weeks, I'm like, oh, my subconscious response when I don't feel good about things. <laughs> Some people like go out and drink and I like stay in and do work. Yeah, um, I, I, same here. Yep. Which is funny. Um, it, it almost, because it's the control, like I've got yeah. control of this. Right. 
which on the other side, people like to lose control. Right. They're like, I don't, I can't control this. And so I'm just right. going to get out of myself. And, right. I think the growth opportunity for me in those moments would be to turn to meditation um, and to just reconnect with myself and, you know, understand that I'm okay just the way I am. It sounds so trite, but it's, it's true. Like I don't need to, I don't need to put on a show. I don't need to, you know, create the next amazing event or look a certain way. It's just, we all come from the same place and it's limitless power. And I don't know, sometimes even just reconnecting with nature, like realizing that we all come from, you know, the same source that created the trees and the beautiful flowers and the plants. To me, there's like a lot of power in that. Ooh, yeah, absolutely. I, and I was wondering, one of the things that I noticed was that people tend to think, and I think this is what was happening with Will, that authentic and rigid are the same thing. Like, oh, I'm being my authentic self. I won't let you. Oh, right. Yeah, like so, stubborn almost. Yeah, exactly. And, and something you said triggered that thought because you were saying like, oh, I don't have to do anything, right? Because I do, I have a friend who, when she is, claiming to be authentic it's like well i don't feel that today i'm just not gonna do it and oh. so so there's this authentic being either rigid like you won't you won't get me to do this thing i'm gonna be authentic to myself and to to give up right like oh i'm not going out today because i'm being my authentic self and i'm gonna stay on the couch mm, yeah are you being your authentic self or are you giving excuses? And that's where- I feel like that's just a mask. Like the word authentic, because it sounds good and yeah. people generally know not to push when you say it. Yeah. Like, like you could replace the word lazy or wanting to stay in your comfort zone or you know any other word for authentic. And it would be like, yeah, I think that's probably a truer description of what's going on. Exactly. So I felt like that was sort of what both Jada and Will were doing, um, mo more specifically Will, he was like, this is the life that I'm creating. Don't get in my way. Yeah. Like, Sit yeah. down, woman. I got you. We're going to be happy. Just take right. happiness, right? Yeah. I was listening to something yesterday and the man says that you have to be overflowing with happiness in, or in order to give some away. Mm -hmm. But if you're weak or lacking and you don't have it, then you're not going to be able to give any away. Will hadn't become happy himself. No, that he was, was performing. Doing. Exactly. He was performing. So how could he then yeah. make Jada happy, so to speak? Because I don't believe in making anybody happy. Yeah. How could he share any happiness with Jada if he didn't have any to give? And so he thought that he was giving her happiness, but he was giving her ego. I'm going to show you, I'm going to control this life we have and it's going to be fine. So smile. And she did for a while. It sounded like she did for a while, but yeah. after a while she couldn't anymore. She's like, I can't. Yeah. And I don't even know who I am. Right. So I can't be authentic. I'd love to be right now as authentic as I can be is broken. Mm hmm. Yeah. yeah. What did you think about, I thought this was so provocative and interesting when they, when Will said, we now no longer have deal breakers in our marriage. And that's how they define unconditional love. Um, and uh, I wish I had the wording a little bit more accurate, but it was something along the lines of, you know, so oftentimes we go into a marriage and we say, we'll remain happy as long as they do X, Y, and Z for us. Mm -hmm. And they flip that on, on its head. And now it's like them being them is what makes me happy. Yeah. And I thought that that was an incredibly provocative, evolved place to arrive at. That is. Uh, I mean, uh, that's the ultimate. That's the ultimate of every relationship. Like, right. I'm so lucky that my mom lets me be myself, always has. And that's yeah. how I so early in life became confident because it was nothing wrong with who I was. It was like, oh, you're being too nerdy or, oh, you're being too... Um, uh, overachiever like there was no overachiever right it was right. just like, 
oh, this kid is a C student, this kid is an A student, whatever. Yeah. Well, I'm like, calm down, quit showing off, none of that. So, yeah. so early on got to experience that. But if you don't get to experience that, where somebody allows you to be yourself, then you get into relationships and you form what you think is going to be right for this person. Now, don't get me wrong. I can be a chameleon. I possess mm -hmm. that skill. Yeah. I can walk into anywhere and become that room. Or I can change the air in the room and make them all become me. Yeah. I don't want either one of those, really. I, but right. I have the power to do right. both of those. And yeah. so really, going back to the being, if I'm really authentic, if I'm really confident, I can just be and I can allow them to be. But yeah. it doesn't always happen like that because we feel like, no, I need you to be a certain way in order for me to be happy. You yeah. got to show up like this. Or I'm like, in order for me to be happy, I've got to show up like this. But if I don't have the right hair, like just today, um, yesterday I posted this thing on, on, the, on social media and one of my, my, my um, fans or friends or whatever said, you look so beautiful. I'm like, Oh, that's interesting because I didn't feel that. I was like, I'm going to go ahead and post, even though today is not the best day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I went ahead and post. So for somebody to see, you have no idea what you look like. You have no idea what you look like. You just think because of the story you've been telling yourself. Oh, my hair is supposed to look like this. My makeup should look like this. My clothes should look like this. I should show up at work like this. This is the, you know, the, the place that I am. This is who I am. And so... If you're not that, then you don't feel yourself. You don't feel authentic. But the way that people see you, if you just allow yourself, if what I did was just do it, <laughs> I was just like, I'm, I'm just going to do it. Like whatever it is, it is. Yeah. And now without even trying, because I didn't, <laughs> still ended up being beautiful. And that is what we can be on the days that we just be rather than do all mm -hmm. the stuff feel like we need to do so I loved that they were able to get there because just like the reason why we're having this conversation is that we're hoping that more people possess the idea or more people um, encourage the idea of looking into your life mm. or examining it and saying what do I need to release or what do I need to embrace so that I can live authentically and I do get to be in love with myself. And there are no deal breakers. Because otherwise, Leia, you piss me off and I'm gone. Yeah. Right? And I don't have a friend because I let whatever you do. Now it's my stuff, not yours. Yeah. Right. It's my stuff. But I'm going to make it about you. She shouldn't have. And we would still be friends. Yeah. She, you know? And so I've done it in the past. I've cut people off. Like I already talked about, it, especially in romantic relationships. Yeah. It's like, oh, didn't do that. Gone. Right. Right. So, but, but learning that you don't have to cut people off just because they don't do the thing you need them to do. Then, oh, wow. Deal breakers gone. And we can just love. But the love great it. thing is they said that they're staying in that relationship. That's what they said. But you can still... Oh, well, actually, Jada said it too. Like, I'm going to live on one side of the house. You're going to yeah. live on the other side of the house. But we're staying in this. And, and so that's another way of um, not leaving but being in it. Like, yeah. you don't have to leave the person. We yeah. just feel like we have to cut people off. Right. We might be cutting our growth off if we do that. Yeah. Well, that's why a lot of people, I think, peace out of relationships whether it's in the early stages of dating or a long-term relationship is they get triggered and it's very uncomfortable and they might not even have the self-awareness to know what's going on, but all they know is that when they're with the, the other person, it's uncomfortable. And oftentimes when you're left by someone, you take it very personally. We were talking about this in my Esther Perel discussion group on Facebook the other day. There was a woman who she had been in a three month relationship with a guy the guy was very strongly pursuing her in the early stages, you know, doing all the stuff, seduction, really trying to impress her. And then he very quickly pulled back, not in relation to any big event in their, um, in their dating experience. And she took it so personally. Um, and we tend to personalize things that 
are going on inside, probably at a subconscious level in the person we're dating. Mm -hmm. um, and I certainly have done that and have been guilty of that. And it's only through the work I've done that I realize, oh, that had nothing to do with me. Got it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. Oh, you were going to say something. Well, what I was going to say is I feel like we've been, um, this is one of our longer episodes, this not surprisingly, <laughs> so, so much juicy content. But um, if you're someone who's looking to connect with yourself and not really sure where to start, um, one of the resources that Kanae and I have mentioned a couple times is this woman, Dr. Shafali, and she has a bunch of online courses, both meditation as well as um, things that are a little bit more uh, on the psychological level. I'm doing one right now called Year of the Awakened Heart, which I highly recommend. And Kanae, do you have any resources you would recommend? Oh, gosh. <laughs> so um, many, I'm sure. I recommend my own resources. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Go yeah, for it. Prosperity Club, because really Prosperity Club is that helps you align with your true authentic self, like your idea of prosperity, how you want to show up in the world. This is the work that I do. This is what I teach on an everyday basis. And to see people go through it, like transition through it is so beautiful, which is why I loved this episode so much. But before we end, it was one point that I wanted to, to make, and that was on the leaving. And they said this in the episode, a couple of times I've said, you know, staying helps you grow. But I'm not saying yeah. that leaving is not appropriate. Yeah. Because there are times where you get to a point and you're like, I'm, I'm done. I learned the lessons I need to and it's time for me to move on. Yeah. Divorce is sometimes imminent. That is the next yeah. you know, final step in this relationship or like logical step in this relationship. So like they said in the episode, I'm not saying stay. You know I'm not saying stay because I haven't done that very well. So, <laughs> so if you need to leave, then leave. Yeah. Um, especially if you're not in a healthy relationship, like you're being hurt or abused or I mean, it's just not healthy. And even if you're the one that's inflicting the abuse, yeah, you need to be the one to leave right. and allow that person to yeah. go in a different way. So I did want to say that because Sometimes leaving is, and sometimes there's an end. The, things come to an end. The great thing about Will and Jada's relationship is they have had several relationships. Yeah. And, yeah. And and I would have liked to have that, but my endurance for pain is very low. Um, and this is what I, I told you that people now text me, here are my takeaways from the episode. <laughs> yeah. Um, one of the things that somebody said that they they had the wherewithal to stay Yeah. Like, did and they've done it before yeah I like, whoa I, I I don't know if I, I can't say I wish I did but I know I don't yeah. I don't have the wherewithal you saw my shirt last weekend I'm not going to be unhappy for more than a few minutes mm -hmm. so if I'm unhappy if I'm in pain I shift I'm like where is the relief yeah and because of that that is why I created Prosperity Club because I know people are looking for relief but it doesn't mean leaving all the time sometimes yeah. relief means what is it about this person that I need to accept? And yeah. my course on Insight Timer is about controlling the controllable, which might be just to accept where you are right now. Sometimes that's all you can control. Mm. I love that. Yeah. So I guess that's our mm -hmm. episode for today. We are totally over. So glad you guys, if you made it to the end, we're so glad you made it. <laughs> To the end, and we want to encourage you to keep coming back. This Prosperity Report Life Edition is something new that we're doing. We want to see if you like it. Put in the comments. Um, you know, tell us. Let us know. If you like it, we'll keep doing it. If you want to interact, find us on Facebook. We are um, Leah K. Marshall. Well, Leah, are you Leah K. Marshall on Facebook? I think I'm Leah Marshall on okay. Facebook. So yeah. It's going to be on my, on Leah Marshall, or it's going to be on Kanae Quarter. It's on either one of our but you can see the video version of this if you want to, or you can go to my website, canacorder.com slash videos, and you'll see the video version of this, or you can listen on the podcast anywhere where you like to listen to podcasts. Love it. So we will see you guys next time, next month. Have a great weekend. Bye. Bye. Yeah.